put you on the map. This is Ron Costa broadcasting live from the Mappable USA studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. And today, folks, we're going to get back to Opportunity Zone, talk about a little bit of the developments therein. There's a lot of news coming on there. And before we get into that, let's introduce Vicki Hutchmala from the Opportunity Zones Authority and the QOZ Marketplace. Vicki, how are you doing? Doing absolutely wonderful today, Ron. Nice and hot. A good thing about it being hot and sunny in Vegas is uh, kind of kills that COVID-19, so we don't have to worry so much about it. Well, well hopefully, but, uh, but we do have to worry about the topic, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we're bringing on a repeat guest. Uh, last time he was on, we really did a great show. We brought him on again. So let's introduce Paul Wasgren from the DLA Piper Law Firm. Paul, how are you out there? How are you doing? Well, I'm holding up well given the circumstances, Ron and Vicki. Thank you very much for having me back on your program. Oh, we love well, we it. Appreciate, yeah, yeah, we appreciate you taking the time out uh, to talk to our audience again. I know there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and uh, you've been on top of it all. And you know, before we get into like the uh, the meat of this podcast, let's just review your background again for the audience who maybe didn't catch the last show. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Paul, and your background, and how you got into this whole Opportunity Zone thing. Well, happily, Ron. Uh, yeah, the Opportunity Zone program is the, the next logical leap for a lot of the clients I've been representing the last 15, 16 years. So historically, representing developers, sponsors, real estate syndicators, and public and private companies doing transactions in the real estate and real estate finance space, um, my clients were very interested. After the 2017 tax reforms, uh, which created the Opportunity Zone program, my clients were naturally curious and sort of forced me to become a uh, a leading expert in in the space, so we've we've seen more than our fair share of deals, and and that deal flow continues despite the impact COVID nineteen has had on our economy this year, somewhat unexpectedly. Uh, but uh, because of that, uh, I think I've been forced to become one of the uh, the talking heads in in the opportunity zone space. And frankly, it's a a topic I quite enjoy discussing. So happy again to to be back on your show. By way of um, yeah. Quick, quick background. I guess I should say I'm a, a corporate partner, but uh, dabble in you know real estate, securities, and, and tax to the extent they impact this space, and uh, work both in uh, the firm's Los Angeles office where I am now, and uh, have a national practice. So I make good use of uh, of uh, our other offices. And frankly, I spend quite a bit of time in, in Nevada still, where I maintain an active uh, license and, and have for the last 16 years. Oh, that's great. That's really great. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions right now with the whole Opportunity Zone space and coronavirus, COVID, whatever. Uh, I think a lot of people think that coronavirus just stopped the whole thing dead in its tracks. And speaking to you and other people involved in the industry, I get the sense that things are still moving along and, and actually, uh, I wouldn't say maybe thriving, but definitely better than it was, let's say, uh, you know, six to eight months ago. Don't you, do you see that? Yeah, I think that's right. We saw a big uptick in the late fourth quarter of 2019 as a result of the Treasury Department finalizing the rules and regulations around this program. That was sort of the uh, the gating moment for a lot of folks who were holding back their capital. And naturally, during the first part of this COVID period where we've been operating under house arrest, essentially, uh, you know, we were busy with, with programs and projects that may have started in Q4 or Q1 of this year. But we're seeing new deals pop up as well, and that's why I'm encouraged and very optimistic, in particular about the second half of 2020. Um, unlike maybe the Great Recession of the late 2000s, uh, I think real estate will not be the cause of any economic dip. I think it'll be the, um, the, the, the saving grace, uh, in fact. I mean, construction workers were generally deemed essential workers in most marketplaces, certainly in California. And in Nevada, a lot of projects have continued. So the physical construction and those who make use of the Opportunity Zone program in the real estate industry, I think, have not been as impacted as perhaps other industries. You know, there are exceptions. Obviously, retailers were struggling before COVID-19, and now I think this is only exacerbating the problems from which many retailers are suffering. But I do see the Opportunity Zone program as, as one of many levers that the government can, can yank or pull to, uh, to help uh, resurrect our, our economic uh, uh, activity going forward. You know, we, we noticed that when 
Opportunity Zones First, the program first uh, initiated, there was a focus on the real estate aspect and, and finding the real estate and investing in the real estate. But now it appears that the focus is changing to business development in the Opportunity Zones and kind of real estate is still very important, but not as focused as it was. Are you finding that? Yeah, I think, Vicki, you're right about that. Uh, folks outside of the real estate industry are starting to make use of this wonderful tax program, which, you know, although it works particularly well for real estate operators, it works just as well for folks outside of that industry. My particular client base, um, you know, is very real estate focused, so I'm, I'm still working primarily on deals that touch or concern real property transactions in some form. But I know in speaking with my colleagues, uh, both at my firm and other firms in this particular space, uh, you're exactly right, Vicki. There, there's an increasing use by folks in a more pure corporate setting uh, to avail themselves of these wonderful benefits under the Opportunity Zone banner. Well, and in light of the uh, a virus and a lot of people out of work and a lot of uh, companies in distress, um, focusing on rebuilding businesses will help a lot in spite of the virus. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, no one wants to bet against the American economy. We've, we've always been Absolutely. very vibrant. And, uh, you know, this, this is a, a little speed bump, frankly, in the long road of, of American economic uh, history. So it'll be an interesting one as we look back on it. But I have confidence in our medical professionals and a variety of folks, uh, both in the United States and abroad, who are working feverishly on a uh, treatment protocol and perhaps also a vaccine. So there's always uh, there are always winners and losers in any uh, disruption, and I, I think this is no exception to that rule. We're going to see a lot of folks do extremely well as a result of COVID-19, and we're going to see other folks who have suffered. I mentioned the retailers. Obviously, they are suffering. But uh, large cap companies, I think, are largely unaffected. Obviously, there are exceptions in the, you know, the hospitality space, but uh, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, to take a few examples in the tech space, they're all doing extremely well. And when you think about the potential application of this tax program, if you're uh, an entrepreneur and you have the latest uh, technology that you want to spin off into a business venture, this would be a great way to, to structure your startup. Um, and I guess one other point I'll mention, you know, we like to stack the Opportunity Zone tax benefits on top of other tax programs, and there's nothing that precludes that stacking of benefits. So, for instance, in the startup space, we like to see our clients stack this with the 1202 uh, provisions under the code. And so if you think about the small business or qualified small business stock exemption, uh, that in combination with the Opportunity Zone program will give entrepreneurs who are successful over the long term uh, a tremendous tax savings when they cash out five and ten years down the road. Yeah, and and we're we're finding also that uh, folks who have that true entrepreneurial spirit will take situations like the virus and uh, the impact of the virus on everyone, and and they'll adapt and and they'll whatever they were doing may be having difficulties or or whatever is going wrong with it, but their adaptability as an entrepreneur will lead it to someplace better, either a better business, a new product, a new way of looking at it, a new restructuring, and like you said, a new way of stacking the, the benefits to help them move forward in a different world. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Those who are a little bit uh, nimble can make good use of uh, this, and instead of seeing it as a headwind, they see it as a tailwind to uh, catapult right. themselves into to some new venture or to uh, modify their existing one. Exactly. Yeah, and we're seeing movement here just in town in a lot of the opportunity zones. I know a lot of people in, uh, const in the construction industry and, Paul, they've been working through this whole thing. They've been on, you know, building Allegiant Stadium, building a lot of stuff in downtown Henderson and all these opportunity zones around that area there. So you are exactly right. There's, um, there is, there, there's, a, there's been a lot of movement over the over, You know, it's funny because some of these guys are like, what are you, what are you talking about? This, my, my life hasn't changed at all. They've been working through this whole thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, in the news this morning, I saw um, Elon Musk's Boring Company uh, was also being tasked now by a couple of the larger hotel operators and casino operators to uh, connect uh, their properties to the Las Vegas Convention Center. So, yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of economic activity. I think uh, the Las Vegas economy in particular is a little bit susceptible to the uh, highs and lows of uh, uh, the economic yes. cycle. But, you know, just as another uh, data point for you to evidence my optimism, some of my private equity clients have raised, you know, large amounts of capital recently through uh, a new fund, and they were really hoping that the downturn in the real estate sector would be more severe because they, you know, they're sitting on a lot of dry, dry powder, and they want to get some real yeah. deals. And and we're yep. we're not seeing a lot of great opportunities yet. Now that's not to say uh, there won't uh, be a few that come along the, the path. But you know, I think that this really underscores just how much capital uh, is is out there. I, I did close a, a transaction in an opportunity zone in Texas a couple of uh, weeks ago. So right in the midst of COVID-19 and the economic gyrations and the stock market and whatnot. And the, the equity piece of that deal was 400% oversubscribed. Wow, so, how about that? Yeah, my client had to turn down three out of every four investors, essentially, that wanted in on that particular project. Oh, my God. We should all be so lucky. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you have a good deal. Everybody likes it. Uh, uh, Paul, are these clients uh, experienced developers that you, that you work with, or are they uh, sponsors? Are they uh, syndicators mostly, brokers maybe? Well, my, my client base has always been a mix. The, the Texas deal to which I allude now is, is a, a development uh, deal ground up in an opportunity zone in, in the Houston area. But, uh, you know, so many examples of, of deals we've done just in the last few months that, again, evidence there's a lot of capital out there and people are moving forward. My client base, again, is definitely real estate oriented, but uh, it's a, a good mix of, of developers uh, private equity shops that come in in a joint venture arrangement, for example, and supply the, the capital. They're the capital partner, and they partner with a developer to put uh, something together. And, of yeah. course, uh, I deal with a lot of folks who are in kind of the, the retail syndication space. So they, they do a deal, they do a series of deals, but they're looking to raise capital from a, you know, a, a large number of outside investors. And in many instances, those are syndicated through broker-dealers, uh, but not in every instance. So it, it is a good mix. Um, again, some of my clients are public and private companies as well. I do their transactional work. And so we're seeing a, a variety of folks, including family offices, that are making very I was going to mention that, yeah. I was, yeah. A lot of the family offices we've heard because the family offices in particular uh, aren't really too upset about tying up their money for 10 years. They're looking for a really, really long term. So they're, they're a great client, and plus they are, all, are always looking for the tax benefits. So you got a perfect marriage right there. Well, that's right. And for the family office client base, it's easy to see the uh, usefulness of the Opportunity Zone program, right? They all have these captive uh, capital gains yeah. dollars, and they would prefer to kick the can on that tax liability. And again, they're not shy about tying that capital up into the next series of projects for a decade. So it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see so many different folks in the marketplace uh, avail themselves of the benefits of this Opportunity Zone program. Again, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, I think this is just a fantastic tax program and a, a great example of what government can and should do to motivate folks in the, in the marketplace to, to drive our economy forward, especially in these troubled times with COVID-19. Yeah. Are yeah. you are you noticing a certain area of the country where you're uh there's more projects going in as opposed to uh you know the larger cities or the smaller cities or even the rural we've uh, done a couple podcasts with uh people who are working opportunity zones for farming and agriculture. So are you noticing any types of projects or any locations that are more prevalent than others? Well, that's a great question, Vicki, and I, I think that I do see some trends. Uh, there's definitely sort of a, a coastal bent to the, the deals that, uh, that I work with clients, and some of that is a, you know, a bit of a bias or a skew based on uh, you know, certain larger private equity shops or larger developers um, you know, maybe being more prevalent in my client base just because of the billing structures that we have here at DLA. But you're, you're, you're right to say that people can make use of this program in the midst of the country as well, even in rural America in an agricultural setting. This works very well. The hot spots that I've seen, however, to answer your question directly, tend to be in the coastal economies. And, and by that, I mean not only uh, Oregon and California, Washington, 
Florida is a hot spot, obviously the eastern seaboard, um, but I mean to include Texas, I guess nominally as a coastal market. And, and so Houston, as I mentioned, uh, Dallas, we're, we're seeing a lot of activity in cities like that. And then I also see a lot of activity in Puerto Rico, uh, interestingly. Oh, yeah. uh, a number of uh, clients that uh, have availed themselves of some of the, the benefits in, in Puerto Rico. More than 90% of that island uh, was designated as an opportunity zone. And uh, I think it's a, a target-rich environment for someone with capital looking to, to do some interesting deals there. Yeah, people forget that there's uh, not just the uh, the 50 states, but uh, Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico um, also participate. Yeah, I think uh, Puerto Rico has a lot going for it above and beyond the opportunity zone allocation. Obviously, the governor of Puerto Rico kind of uh, won the lottery in terms of allocation of uh, the geographic footprint of his <laughs> island. <laughs> Pretty much. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's the only place in the world where a U.S. citizen can lawfully not pay uh, federal income tax under Act 40 there. And, of course, there's some other incentives. So I, I think for, you know, the right industry and the right uh, investor, Puerto Rico has some opportunity. A lot of um, smart money will favor the states that have, much like Nevada, no income tax at the individual right, level. Right. So Florida and Texas are great examples of that, Washington also. You know, California tends to tax us all to death, and, and if you can, you know, navigate through that, we've got great weather um, and a great workforce, but uh, it, California is definitely not competitive in the opportunity zone space. People will still do it. We're very active with clients. Probably a third of my client uh, base touches or concerns California in some fashion. That's not necessarily the reason I'm here. But uh, California, again, is not competitive because they have not adopted conforming legislation. So right. if you're an That's investor, yeah, if you're an investor, you're going to get the federal tax benefits, but not the state tax benefits in California. And I know that the state treasurer, Fiona Ma, has really tried to push, but she's not in the legislative branch. And so for the moment, unfortunately, California is going to be about 13% more expensive uh, than, than a non-California opportunity. You think that all the uh, news coverage now, where it seems like every news program and, and newspaper is mentioning opportunity zones in one way or another, do you think that's going to have any kind of a, a large impact on more people getting involved in opportunity zones? Well, I think part of our, our mission is to uh, educate, uh, and uh, for you know a number of folks in, in the country, smart money included, the folks have not really dug into this program. So there are a number of conferences and expos, and I try to attend a number of them. Uh, there's a virtual expo this year, um, the OZ Expo. Uh, last year at this time it was held in, in Nevada, as I think you remember. Right, the OZ Expo. Yes, and I'm, I'm particularly fond of, of uh, the organizer of that series of conferences. I think they do a nice job. And so th that's just one example. I mean, we're out there trying to evangelize, in a sense, and make people aware of this program, and hopefully it uh, continues to gain traction. There, there is obviously some uh, concern about the November elections. We, we can't forecast with any certainty how that might turn out. But, again, both Democrats and Republicans uh, were at least originally proponents of this program. So with that sort of uh, bipartisan support, my sincere hope and desire would be for this program to continue uh, well into 2021 and, and beyond, no matter who wins the, uh, the race in November. Well, can you tell us um, the new uh, rules were uh, new rules and regulations just came out. They were a little bit more focused. What kind of impact do they have on the overall project um, or specifically on the investors or participants in the whole program? What do you th what do you think about it? Well, I've been impressed. You know, we often have kind of a, a low standard for what the government can do for us. But I, I would say I'm, I, I'm very, you know, and I, I have my own biases. But I have to say I've been truly impressed by the Treasury Department. I think Secretary Nugent and his whole team have done a nice job of promulgating rules and regulations around this act of Congress. I and agree. I think, and again, we've seen some nice bar, bipartisan support. The most recent developments with the IRS, which, again, can only regulate, they don't legislate, but they can regulate this program. And so earlier this month, uh, the IRS uh, pushed out Notice 20-39, and it provided a lot of relief for investors wishing to avail themselves of this program and for sponsors and developers operating within the Opportunity Zone space. I won't go into a lot of detail, but kind of a, 
the, the 30,000 foot view of this is that because of COVID-19, the Treasury Department realizes they had to push out some of the deadlines. And so basically any deadline that fell between the start of April of this year um, and July was going to be pushed out. And so if you're an investor, for instance, and you're running up to that 180-day deadline within which you had to invest and fund your opportunity fund, you can now do that through the end of the year, essentially. Um, if you're a sponsor developer type uh, and you're going to have to meet your 90% test at the end of June, which is coming right up in a few days, basically everybody gets a free pass on the 90% test in June. So two little examples, but the IRS has really gone out of their way to uh, provide some, some relief uh, for taxpayers. And again, I think this can only help spawn interest and enthusiasm for the Opportunity Zone program and allow it to do what the underlying principle suggests it should do, and that is drive investment capital into communities that, that do need that investment capital. So we'll see. Yeah, as we, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, well what, I I, what I was going to say is um, – the, the program took so long for people to even find out about it, to get educated about it, and the government to fine-tune its rules and regulations that a lot of time was uh, basically wasted. And now, as it's getting down to, to the wire of the first phase, uh, now is when people are participating, and now is when people are really getting active and excited about it. Do you think that there will be any new legislation that will expand the program into the future, aside from the deadlines that are already within it? Well, once again, a great question, Vicki. I, I think that there, there can and should be. Um, to, to express my own opinion, some additional legislation in this space. Certain senators have talked about this program. Certainly Tim Scott from South Carolina, who's a GOP senator, uh, has talked about this. Uh, he was one of the original proponents of the program. And during the legislative process leading up to the Jobs Act of 2017, which enshrines this program, uh, some of the language he wanted was stripped out. And he's talked about maybe passing some legislation or at least promoting it that would, for example, reinsert some accountability and some, some statistical tracing so that we can yeah. better assess the impact that this program is having in the communities where it is intended to have an impact. So right now there isn't a lot of reporting. Um, IRS Form 8996 gathers some but not a lot of, of data points. Um, other senators like uh, Wyden out of Oregon have threatened to denude up to 200 opportunity zones of their status. Uh, I think that would obviously be injurious to the program. I'm not sure quite what, what would motivate a member of Congress, uh, in particular the Senate, to, uh, to do that. But uh, again, I'm, I'm very pro-opportunity zone. Um, and I, I would love to see some, some uh, legislative maneuvers to expand, not contract the program. And a number of folks in the industry, and I suppose I'm one of them, have suggested a few things that might further enhance the applicability of this program in uh, certain areas that maybe haven't benefited yet. Um, you know, one of the, the much talked about points is that instead of requiring qualifying capital gains dollars to be fed into an opportunity fund in order to capture the benefits of the 10-year rule and so on and so forth, there is some talk of just allowing ordinary uh, money to, to flow in. And you can, you can invest ordinary money, but you're not going to get the, you know, the 10-year benefits and so right. on and so forth. So, you know, again, that, that would have to come not from the IRS but from Congress. And, you know, we'll see what Congress looks like after the November elections. Um, but I'm thinking uh, independent of uh, the outcome of the November elections, uh, I'd sure love to uh, see this program expanded by the Democrats and the Republicans in a, a very collaborative way to show the American public that, yes, we can pull together in these times of distress and uh, come out even stronger than uh, we were before COVID-19 and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Well, and, and you know, uh, the fact that there was no history, there was nothing to look back on to, to um, ascertain success or of any project or anything, it made it a little difficult for people to take that risk, jump in and, and actually do it. But w now that it's um, got momentum and now that it's starting to build and things are happening and in light of the virus, you would think that they would more want to expand it instead of retract it because it's for the good of the economy and all of the people in general. 
especially those in the in the actual opportunity zones. Well, that's and right. Adjacent. And adjacent. You raise a good point, and and if we think back on recent weeks, we've had a lot of uh, civil unrest in the country, uh, and it's uh, brought to our attention again a very important issue of injustice. And when we think about the opportunity zones, a lot of them are, um, you know, occupied by folks from minority communities. And again, if if we can go back to the legislative intent behind the opportunity zone program, we want to drive capital into some of these communities that, that need that help. And, uh, you know, frankly, I think this is a great mechanism, a great tool to do that. It, it uh, you yeah, know, kind no of guides, yeah. guides the invisible hand, as Adam Smith would, would say. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And like you said earlier, it could be the vehicle that actually gets us back to a, a, a great economy. The opportunity zones can, can do that if they're done correctly. So. I think you're you're you nailed it. You're you're right on for that 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 topic. Um, but there is a there is a few other a couple of questions I want to ask you, uh, Paul. Just getting back to the real estate end of this before we kind of close this up. Uh, you know, we talked about some of the sectors that are going to get hit hard, like retail and and uh, you know, uh, hotel, et cetera. Do do you see any any industry in particular that you think is going to really benefit from this? Maybe uh, industrial or multifamily. Are, are any of your clients specifically looking for one over the other? Well, there's no doubt that multifamily continues to be a favorite, um, and I guess we could include some specialty uh, areas like student housing. Uh, those tend to be real money makers, and just because of the allocation of the zones, a lot of areas around large universities, um, you know, qualified. And so investment in those areas is a bit of a slam dunk for private equity investors. Uh, we've seen a lot of activity there right from the beginning, and that continues to be a strong area. I think the losers, again, would be some of these retail operators. And, you know, I, I don't know that we can go into a lot of um, statistical uh, sampling there, but uh, I, I'm not sure that retailers are going to be able to make good use of the Opportunity Zone program. But what can happen with some of these shuttered malls is that folks can come in, if they happen to be in a zone, and repurpose them. And I think that the Opportunity Zone program and its various rules and regulations would overlay very nicely on that type of business plan. And I, I'm aware of some, some developers and sponsors, in particular out of Florida, that uh, have that type of business plan. And they've been very successful um, throughout the country at, at doing that. If you think about you know, some of the old boxy retailers like Sears and JCPenney, which have obviously struggled over time, um, you know, those, those uh, resources that they have can be sold off and, and repurposed uh, for, for other uh, other business models, and if you think about, you know, Amazon and uh, some of these other operators that could maybe absorb some of that space, I, I think that there's there's an opportunity for for the the smart money to come along. Boy, does that sound like a winner right there. I agree. That is that is a great great insight. The, the other example, I guess, Ron, that I would share with you and Vicky and your listeners is um, the the retooling of some suite hotels. Um, so if, if um, hospitality operators were struggling before COVID-19, I think, uh, you know, the recent uh, impact on the economy will probably uh, put them over the edge. But, you know, some of those properties can be picked up in a distressed sale and uh, pretty easily converted into a multifamily. And, uh, right. again, right, at this point in our, our cycle, we, we are definitely in a, a short supply environment for housing. Again, completely the opposite of what happened in 2008-9, where we built too many single-family homes in particular. But, uh, again, there's an opportunity for some smart money to come along and pick up some of those distressed hotel properties, convert them, and, again, could make full use of the opportunity zone if, they, if the properties happen to fall in a, in a zone. Yeah, no, no doubt. Maybe, maybe some of these smart money guys are listening to this podcast right now. Uh, let's hope so. But, you know, I, I think one of the biggest impacts that coronavirus had, uh, is that we, and you alluded to it before, is it, it, it made the IRS our friend for change. You know, the IRS has always been like, you know, are you on a deadline? We're not going to extend it. You know, it was very, very, uh, you know, this is the way it is. Now they're like, okay, well, we'll give you some extra time here. That's unheard of. When does that ever happen? <laughs> well, I, I agree, and I think we've all been forced, including – you know, industry uh, practitioners uh, in, in my shoes to, uh, to change our opinion. 
exactly. and you know, again, I, I have to take my hat off and, and uh, express my sincere thanks to Secretary Nugent. I think he's been one of uh, the real winners in the current administration. I think he's been um, an anchor uh, for President Trump, and I think he's done well by every American, no matter what our political preference. Uh, so again, hats off to Secretary Nugent and his team for creating some of these opportunities for us. I've been very impressed. Well, and being Excellent. able to, to see the real, uh, what's happening in real life and, and without platitudes and, and talk has actually done something that has actually impacted the, the regular, everyday person in the country. You know, it's like, it, you, you're absolutely right, Paul. I'm very impressed with uh, uh, Mnuchin and uh, with President Trump and being able to see and do what needs to be done. That's and, special. Yeah, and with regard to COVID-19, I, I think Congress and the administration acted very swiftly. And if they hadn't, I think the economic impact would be much more severe. Oh, gosh. I, I had no doubt that we were going to look at a V-shaped recovery, and, and the stock market uh, got that right for sure this time. Exactly. I agree. You know, people were talking about, oh, the economy is going to be so distressed, so bad, and, and this is going to go on for 18 months or two years. Or, and I'm thinking, no, 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 this is America. And in America, we adapt, we do what we need to do, and we're going to have a V recovery, and it's going to be sooner than later and way before anybody expects it, which is what's going on exactly. Well, many of us are still nursing whiplash. I mean, it happened faster than we, we thought. <laughs> that. That. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Paul, listen, if anyone listens to this and wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way they can do that? Well, to be candid with you, Ron, I, I would welcome your listeners to reach out directly, and I'll just give you my, my mobile number. They can text or call any time. Again, we're all operating still under house arrest largely. Uh, that's, yes. Yes. <laughs> Area code 617-461-4061. Okay, great, great. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, I mean, this has been really informative, of course, and there's always new things happening in the in the Opportunity Zones industry, so we're really glad to have you on the, the podcast today, Paul. Thanks so much for taking the time out and, and talking to our, our listeners. Vicki, do you have anything that you want to say to close us out? Any comments or last questions? Well, you know, this is what I would say, and I always say this, I come back to it. It's the purpose of the Opportunity Zone program was to go into areas that were distressed, to go into communities where people didn't have maybe the opportunities that others did, and to retool it and to elevate the quality of life of those residents. And now that there's momentum in the program and opportunity zones, and we have professionals like Paul who are making that happen, we can only expect bigger, better things in the future for opportunity zones, as well as the persons who live there and the businesses that uh, operate there. I think it's great. I think it's good. And I think Paul is doing an excellent job to make that happen. Well, thank you. I share your enthusiasm for the program, and again, when we look back, we'll we'll be able to assess. But uh, I certainly see uh, all green lights that I had for the program. Absolutely. Okay, last thing, Paul. Are you on any kind of? I know you talked about the Opportunity Zone Expo. Are you doing anything? Any? Are you a panelist on anything coming up, or or, or any kind of conferences? Well, in fact, uh, yes, I had uh, been contacted by the organizers of the OZ Expo, and although it is in a virtual format this year. Um, I've agreed to speak as, as one of the panelists, and so uh, very much looking forward to that. That's June 24th and June 25th in a virtual format, so hope to see you both there, of course. Yep. Great, great. We'll get, to, we'll get to see the background in your home office. How about that, right? <laughs> On video. Yeah, just we don't <laughs> care if you wear uh, pajamas or shorts. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dry cleaner hasn't seen much of me the last three months. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, everyone. Listen, you're listening to the Mappable USA podcast over at mappableusa.com. If you go to that website, you just scroll down a little bit, you'll see all our syndication sources. So you never miss another episode if you subscribe to any one of them. So, so go do that. And there's also a, a, a guest tab on there. If you want to be a guest on the show, like Paul was today, fill that out. We'll see what we can do about getting you on the show. 
If you like what you heard, send us an email, info at mappableusa.com, or just send a comment on the page that you're listening to this right now. We'd love to hear some feedback from you. So once again, thank you so much for your support. Thanks for listening. We'll be at you next week with another Mappable USA podcast. Have a great week, everyone. 